entitled uh, EDR versus CM, the fight for a combined and uh, holistic approach. My name is Michel de Crovazier. I'm a threat detection lead in a security operation center in Austria. I'm a threat bounty developer at Sog Prime and a guest contributor at Red Canary as well. I'm also a frequent uh, speaker at the B side. Thanks for joining. And also the author of different projects that you can find on my uh, GitHub, mainly about Windows um, logs, event logs, and mind maps that you can find on my repo. So, EDR, endpoint detection and response. As you may know, it's a modern solution to detect threats and evolution of antivirus. And it's a great tool for cybersecurity responders um, where you can allow your assets to be detect, uh, to detect threats uh, with some automatic response, behavior analytics, and um, threat intelligence. It also allows you to get some um, advanced acquisitions on files, memory dumps, etc., and to perform some deep investigations. And it's a good complement in the um, operating system security landscape where it gets combined with some event logs, some third-party security tools, and the EDR will protect your integrity of the operating system. But there is one thing. EDR, because they're very efficient, they became recently a target by attackers, uh, where they really focus on this tool and attempt to tamper it, to disable it, so then they can just get into your system and do whatever they want. So let's have a look on the different um, evasion operations that exist on EDR and what hackers, what attackers could use uh, against your system. Usually the first thing is avoiding an asset with an EDR, which means an asset where you cannot install an agent because it's too old, like some very old Linux, Windows, or Unix systems, or simply you cannot have anything because of the it's locked by a vendor. Usually, um, when in the recent attack that we have seen, the attackers they hide into hypervisors, VMware HPV or VMware uh, sorry Microsoft HPV and VMware E6. And what attackers do is just they implant their threats inside, they put some proxy tools, they put some beacons, etc., and then stay for longer hidden from any security solutions and then move laterally on the network. And it's hard to detect them. This is an example in an attack uh, where it happened on the Hyper-V systems. And what the attacker did is just like they uh, got access to this Hyper-V system, create a fresh new virtual machine with nothing, deploy the arsenal of uh, plenty of offensive tools. And afterwards, when they got the, their tool in place, they shut down all the virtual machines from the company to unlock the drive, and afterwards, they encrypt everything. And they were in undetected so far. Another place where you can hide is on network devices, especially routers or exposed network devices. Uh, it happened recently uh, with some Cisco devices where the attackers just over, uh, found some vulnerabilities it totally rewrite uh, and uh, re erase the operating system with a custom one where they install it with a custom implant and they could stay uh, obfuscated for long term. And it happened the same with some uh, Fortinet devices, for example, where the attackers um, just found some exposed Fortinet managers, um, network managers, get into it, then move as the next step to all the firewalls of the company put some implants on it, and finally targeted uh, um, the different assets, Windows and Linux machine in the company. But everything was done from the Fortinet devices. Now, another thing is about EDR tapering. So when an attacker will uh, be on an asset, Windows or Linux most of the time, and he will face an EDR which is protecting the system. And one of the common things, it will try to avoid it, oh sorry, to tamper it. So to disable the protections to perform its offensive actions. And one of the very common actions, so trendy uh, things at the moment, is bring your 
own vulnerable driver. In short, the attackers, they try to find vulnerable drivers available by third party vendors, security solution, etc., and then abuse the Microsoft security enforcement, which force um, the Microsoft Windows system uh, that only um, drivers which are signed can be loaded. Well, what the attackers do is just they find a vulnerable driver, which is signed, load it into the system, and then uh, bypass all the protections because they are coming from signed drivers. And one of the good examples, actually, it was reported two days ago by Avast. Um, the attackers just found a vulnerability in a native Windows driver from the app locker solution. And this attack, is, uh, in doing this attack, they abused, it was the last happening last year in 2023. And they leveraged these vulnerable drivers to escalate privileges. And actually, this happened a lot, as you can see, and with Kaseka ransomware. Uh, some of them are related to Intel drivers, some of them from gaming drivers, uh, some security solution, etc. If you're a defender, a good thing to begin and to tackle uh, this um, vulnerability is to use this project, um, Load Drivers. It's open source and it lists all the vulnerable drivers that are at least identified and um, a hash, a name, and everything is provided so you can do some detections with your security tools. Like mainly, for example, with Sy Sysmon, you can create some detection rules here based on the binary names um, and uh, just check log logs and see if it's matching. If you have some hashes, you can also check it, etc. And you can also use, if you want, the Microsoft recommended block driver list uh, that you can find on the internet as well. Another thing which is very important is like most of the EDR solutions, they rely on the ETW, Event Trace for Windows. This kind of a library, uh, providing telemetry, which was started with Windows XP a long time ago, which is not quite used a lot, uh, especially with Windows 11, I think there is like more than 50,000 events from different providers, which provide a lot of telemetry about network, performance, CPU, memory usage, etc and also security. And EDR attackers, they want to target this because it provides visibility for the EDR. If you cut this, your EDR will be partially blind. Interestingly, ETW uh, vulnerability has just exploded in the last years, as you can see, because more and more attention is paid to this um, uh, usage, and also because it's quite used by EDR. Um, in the last year, a lot of attacks were reporting, um, were reporting attackers deactivating, bypassing, or just um, cancelling the behavior of the ETW channels uh, to blind the um, EDR. And you can see some examples here, and you have also some different uh, frameworks that you can use for testing purposes. And in this schema, here you will see uh, what an attacker can do, he can leverage from uh, an application that is owned, he can either disable the sessions, modify the registry to, uh, to block some telemetry, and at the end just to, again, get half the visibility of the EDR and perform the offensive actions. Another thing that um, attackers would um, use is a uh, bypass is anti-malware scan interface, AMSI. It's kind of a third-party library provided by Microsoft in the form of an API for third-party security vendors. So for example, if you have like using Trend, Trend will sit behind this API and will catch any security activity which is happening on the system, like any PowerShell activity, and it will get it via this API. Of course, again, if you blind this API, if you disable it, if you tamper it, you blind the solution. And this is how the different threats and tamper methods uh, were abusing in the last year this MSI um, security solution. And the last one was the last, um, last, last year uh, where the DLL assembly file uh, was bypassed as well. Another one that attackers like to do is abusing DLL side loading. So what they try to do is just to manipulate the trusted applications 
and execute um, an unauthorized DLL. And this is quite frequent. And there is a good project actually online that you can use as a defender again, where are listed all those vulnerable DLLs that can be abused to leverage this DLL side loading. In addition of that, if you have like a, if you're an amateur or you're using Splunk as CM, there is a very good project uh, which compile and provide some detections uh, about like detecting DLL side loading based on the logs. Coming back to the blinding of the sensors, well, we mentioned this um, ETV thingy, but there is a lot of methods that attackers would use again to tamper and to disable and the EDR. They will remove the DLL hooks that are set up by the EDR. They will uh, remove the kernel callbacks, block the EDR communication, so the EDR is still active, but it cannot communicate uh, with its central management solution, which can be in the cloud or on-premise. And another fact, which was very interesting, they will also sometimes set the communication between the driver and the, pale, uh, the EDR executable to zero. So the driver cannot communicate um, to the um, pill um, executable itself, and therefore he cannot tell, hey, I have found a threat, something is not working, and he's getting totally blind again. And one very trendy thing is blinding the EDR. Blinding means uh, when the attackers they are in the environment, and they will learn how you are behaving, what tools your organization is using, and then we we'll leverage on that. One of the most common things is, uh, for example, abusing the LOL bins. LOL bins, it's uh, like a living of the land. It's a project, it's, sorry, it's a tool, a uh, method, which consists of abusing uh, well-known uh, executables that are on the system on Windows. And attackers will leverage those tools, abuse it, and then perform some actions, which depending how you use it, may be malicious or not. And that's why the EDR made behave in different ways if it's malicious or not. Recently, we have this uh, Tiffon uh, Vault um, report, which was reported by Microsoft, uh, which targeted um, some uh, energy sector. And the attackers really leverage in a very high density everything about the LOL beans. So they limited at the maximum what they could use, I would like s malicious uh, tools, and just focus on things and tools that were on the system. Some examples of those uh, lol bins are like, I mean, some, one, some of them are quite known, uh, especially this MSC exec, if you install some, some tool uh, software, regular for modifying the registry, or like manipulate the WME or library as well. And I mean, this is just 1% of the list. There is a lot of them. The list is growing a lot. Um, and for that, there is a project, lolbass which is compiling uh, all the non uh, lol bins and you can use it again as a defender to put some specific flag to only collect um, executables which are flagged or non has um, lol bus. And I found, I found it really interesting. Uh, well from a few weeks ago, a guy released a project for all the living of the love project. So here you can find all of them. I would like lolbass for Linux, lolbass for Mac, um, lolbass for false positive, for drivers. There is a lot. So if you have a defender, I just invite you to have a look on it. It's just an amazing resources. Um, talking about the Windows subsystem for Linux, if you're not familiar with it, it's just a way to have a, a minor or light version of Linux on Windows. It's a very light virtual machine. And actually, s a lot of people, like system administrators or developers, will use this on their laptops or computers on a daily basis um, just to develop, to access Git, etc. But on the other end, attackers will also leverage this to enable this on the server and just to hide and obfuscate everything uh, running offensive tools inside. And for example, what they can do is they can just proxy some executions by, for example, accessing from, uh, from wind, um, <coughs> Windows file systems directly or call some Windows binaries from the Linux system as well. And again, remaining in a low um, profile, not be detected. 
they can also install the specific Linux distribution, which is a bit customized uh, with uh, some already preloaded offensive tools. And they can also leverage some PowerShell Linux obfuscation because you can nowadays install PowerShell on Linux in the last versions and then perform everything you want there. Luckily, again, as a defender, uh, you can see this activity, depending on the context, uh, uh, in the Windows event log. If you have the process execution uh, um, auditing activated, you will see part of the activity, not everything. Um, and that's probably what's that's why Microsoft released recently, um, a s it's called like a VSL2 plugin that you can add to your subsystem, uh, it's a DLL, and then it will provide advanced security features uh, combined with your Microsoft Defender endpoint, so you get more visibility inside what's happening into the VSL. Finally, another thing which attackers are abusing in a network is abusing remote service or remote tools, like RDP, SSH, or like remote tools to manage uh, your system, like TeamViewer, uh, Easy Connect, etc., or any desk. Yeah. And that's why they are like moving from this very well-known abuse tool like PowerShell, PSExec, etc., slowly using Subitrack, Vimicat, but then using commercial tools here that are used by all the organization. And because they are quite used, it's very hard to identify if it's legitimate or not. And well, here you can see a list of all those tools which are commonly used uh, by attackers but at the same time by organization, which makes a very easy um, point for the attackers to leverage and to exfiltrate uh, data to control the system or just to keep footprint inside the network without being detected. Finally, attackers, what they would do also to abuse is just operate uh, like in blind spots. So for example, as an idiot doesn't have uh, unlimited resources, they would just take some advantage of that and they will leverage this in, I like this schema, in this pyramid where they will always try to not be on the top of the pyramid because they can be catched. For example, they will never try to do some dumps or using some file deletion or process termination. They will keep again a low profile by focusing on the TTPs and legit tools that we mentioned previously. Yeah, I agree, but they're not perfect, and sometimes attackers can also abuse the idea itself. So I just want to share with you some examples about some stories that um, I found publicly. So this one is about the Palo Alto idea, uh, which, for example, uh, a researcher found that he could dump the LSAS process in Windows. This process contained all the passwords of the system, legitimately, without any alert, using a binary from Palo Alto itself, that without any alarm. Another one, still with uh, Palo Alto uh, EDR, reported by Checkpoint, is where the attackers they'll use a DLL from the Palo Alto to sideload and perform the attack again. Uh, another example, this one, this time with Sentinel-1, uh, I found it on Twitter, this one. Um, they found that you can do again a dump of any PID, I mean any process with a PID, using the um, the binary of Sentinel-1 and just get the results into a dump file. So you can dump, of course, the Sentinel-1 process, but you could, could dump LSAS process, for example. And this one was is quite interesting. It's about the Octa breach, which happened some uh, three years, two years ago. And the attackers, they uh, just got on the system, uh, then they downloaded Process Hacker, which is a well-known tool to at troubleshoot the system, but also it's quite abused uh, by attackers, and they just kill the process of the FireEye agent EDR solution on the system. And afterwards, it was just open party, they could do whatever they want because the process was killed, and they could just move laterally and breach the full organization. And finally, a uh, very trendy thing as well, attackers are, lever are leveraging uh, Rust generally speaking, in the, in the payload they use. Why Rust? It's a multi-language, uh, multi-platform um, language. You can use it on Windows, on Linux, on Mac, you use a virtual machine, and uh, you can just bypass some static analysis as well. And that's why it's very frequent to have some payload like that. 
And some tools also exist to grab the configura configuration of the EDR, this time not to bypass it, but to understand, OK, which folders, which process, which drivers are whitelisted. So then the attacker can, for example, put a specific payload into a specific folder, which is just whitelisted and allowed, and then can do whatever he wants without trigger any alarm. And finally, here, just to do a short recap, if you want to, do, uh, to have some fun with your EDR, those are some tools which are like abused by attackers. You can also use it for testing. Uh, but this one, for example, the Terminator one, was using this uh, Zemana anti-malware driver uh, by some to just, yeah, again, drop the EDR, get it off of the game, and then perform the infiltration. Um, so I just invite you to test them. Uh, on the other side, this Crimson EDR, this one is to help and to analyze the behaviors of the EDR to see which um, method they attempt to bypass. Is they just try to uh, just uh, patch the ETV uh, solution or the AMC, etc. So it's more like a defender tool or maybe a malware reverser uh, tool to see and understand how an EDR can work. Oh sorry, how a payload offensive like those one, Terminator, Snowblad, and Silencer can work. OK, so we know a bit what EDR can do. We know that they're vulnerable. What can we do now? That's the question. So here's one of the solutions. I would like to propose is to use a CM. A CM is kind of a big data lake where you can ingest all your data, all your logs into a specific place and then leverage this data, correlate it, enrich it, and identify some threats or suspicious behavior. But one of the things you need to ask yourself is, OK, I have an EDR. I want a CM. What should I check first? Well, having an EDR and a CM have some good reasons to uh, stay together. First, an EDR may be tamper disabled, as we have seen. So having a logging solution on your Linux system or Windows system will always be a good solution as a plan B or backup system in case your EDR is off, for example. Another thing is EDR, as we have seen, cannot be installed on all the devices, especially in the OT world or uh, also like on the network devices where it can be installed, sometimes from historical reasons, incompatibility, performance impact, etc. Some devices also may not have internet access, maybe air gapped, and again, they cannot be connected to anything. And another thing is like EDR, sometimes they may have a shorter retention. And therefore, if you want, if you have some um, complaints which uh, requires you to give, keep logs for one year, two years, well, you may also want to know what's happened two years ago in case you have a breach. And here, it's a very nice project. I invite you to have a look at EDR telemetry. It's well updated, and it keeps vis um, um, updates on all the sensors and features of all the EDRs, about what they can do, what they can see, why they don't see, etc. And in case you have an EDR and you are buying uh, any one of them, well, you know at least that on the red um, square here, you should invest or put some resources to complement or fill this gap. OK, so how CM can come here and help us at the rescue? So let's have a look. Usually, when you start a CM project, is uh, everything will be great. So we will get everything. We will use some detections. We'll get some alerts. But most of the time, it's not always like that. Uh, a CM in the glance, uh, um, as I mentioned before, uh, has a lot of features, enrichments, correlations. Uh, um, you can connect it also to a SOAR. And what it will do, uh, it will just grab your data um, from uh, the event logs, some third-party solution that you may have on your system, and send it to a specific location that you have choose. It can be an online CM, um, a cloud CM, on-premise, etc. And then that's a challenge, expectation versus reality. Expectations, you will, s you will expect that everything goes well, but it doesn't go often like that. And sometimes, well, uh, you, your CM runs under heavy load, too many alerts, you cannot handle it. You have too many logs, uh, you run out of the license, and too many alarms. So to make this 
something easier, at least from the Windows world, I designed a set of um, a toolkit uh, that I want to share today with you, where from different steps you can easily get um, some telemetry from the Microsoft system, and using Splunk get into your CM, and they detect EDR bypass easily. One of the first steps is about research, it's just more like uh, how those Windows logs work. Um, and then, once you have it clear, you can just uh, use some uh, templates about GPO and settings uh, to enable all the telemetry on the Windows operating system. After that, you will be logging some data and on the event logs. And the next step uh, would be after you enable the auditing, increase the size uh, of the logs, and uh, enable the disable logs. Everything is already pre prepared, and you just need to install it. Uh, you will need to ingest it in some place. It can be any CM you like, Arcsight uh, for the old ones, CM, Sentinel, etc. In this case, I choose Splunk and I provide some compression files which will, once installed, will collect all the necessary telemetry uh, in your CM. And globally, uh, in this uh, toolkit, you will find uh, like around 70 different uh, event logs, providers, and sources that you can use for a lot of purposes. You can, of course, customize it as much as you want. But you can also use it against um, uh, with uh, using, for example, these uh, Sigma rules. I mean, if you're not familiar with Sigma, it's a format to define uh, detection uh, languages in the like an algorithm. So it's like an agnostic uh, compared to the vendor. And uh, on my repo, you can find around uh, 200, 300 detection rules. Of course, there are a lot of online, especially on Florian, Rotem, and um, on GitHub. So just just the beginning, an input that I'm sharing here. But once you have that in place, you can already start doing some detections. Uh, one of the things is you, will, you may struggle with the EPS performance or the volume of the logs, which happens frequently with the Windows logs. It's great to have a lot of visibility, but then it's too much. And sometimes we you have some specific assets, or you have some constraints, or license, or performance, where you say, OK, I need to reduce the amount of logs. And that's why I came into my company with a different approach uh, where I have proposed different solutions to reduce the log volume. So of course, you can apply some filtering. That's easy. Use Sysmon from Microsoft. Actually, also the, you have the Linux version now. Or another approach, which is I call it the light baseline or the full baseline. Full baseline, you get full visibility, but also full of logs and full of um, EPS and storage. And uh, that's why I came with a light baseline, which is like a light solution to collect some just minimal telemetry on Windows. You can, of course, adjust it and still perform some monitoring um, for EDR bypassing, of course, but also in general on the system. Um, on the full baseline, you get full visibility, PowerShell activity, process execution, um, login, fail login, etc. And this, I have had some measures here, but so far it really depends on your activity on the systems, but just to get a roughly ad idea how much, how much it would consume. And then you have the light baseline. Light baseline provides all those informations here. So you see some good visibility, what's happening on the action servers, on the SQL servers, some PK uh, servers, etc. and still at a low volume. And what I also thought about, we talked about the lower bins, you remember before, uh, you could do some extend and just filter on the process execution all the process which are related to uh, binaries known as the lower bins. So you don't get everything, but at least you catch these lower bins processes which can be used to detect any EDR bypass, for example. Uh, with this approach, actually came another thing. I call it triggering event versu versus a testing event. A triggering event is like something, a command that an attacker would run on a place. As you can see here, someone uh, trying to sideload the DLL on the DNS servers. Right. But these events are quite noisy. And therefore, if you really want to catch the juicy stuff, you can also dig into it and just get the real one. So this is a triggering event, which is triggered after um, the this command execution is um, applied to the system. And the main difference between triggering and a testing event, you can find it here. Triggering event are like usually security related, well not documented, quite noisy actually, but you may have a risk of detection, uh, of risk of failure because you may not enable the auditing, someone disables the GPO, uh, etc. 
And that's why these attesting events may also come as a complementary approach uh, at a low price uh, where you can attest like with high uh, availability if something suspicious happened or not. As an example, I provide you some uh, different TTPs or suspicious activity that you can catch with this light based on approach. I put the uh, event IDs for Windows that can be useful and what you can detect here. For example, this one you can detect a transport agent which would be installed on a um, mail, um, exchange mail server and which is actually quite abused by attackers. And if you do a more one step forward with EDR focus, here are like another set of uh, detections based again, you have the event ID and what you can detect and which TTPs you can use um, to detect uh, some EDR tampering, uh, bypassing, uh, blinding, etc. This is just a small set, of course this could be a long list, but uh, just to show you that with a minimal data set of information you can get a lot of visibility as a low volume, until of course you know which telemetry you need and where it's located. And as a defender, what we do like is to validate the detection. So we have everything in place, we have telemetry, but we want to be sure that we can catch suspicious side loading, etc. And that's when it comes to validation. We want to be sure that everything is working. It's a bit about the purple teaming, sometimes would I would call it like that. You can automatize that with some tools, and there is a full uh, data set of uh, solutions that you can use online, uh, depending on what, of course, you want to do. Uh, if you are more like on the policy side, on the detection tools with the Sigma project, uh, with response tool, here you can see my minor contribution with some EVT example that I have published, and some other ones like Atomic uh, that you can use. So here, just giving you some um, clue assets how to move forward, and one of the good things is like you need to know what are your vulnerabilities uh, to understand what you need to do what gap you need to cover uh, to uh, increase your defense. And that's why you can, for example, for that, you can use different data sets of um, tools uh, from Red Canary, from Splunk, from uh, Caldera, from the Mitre, as well from Datatadog. And all those uh, tools will uh, leverage and help you to trigger some detections in a very automatic way to be sure that you are co your coverage that is supposed to uh, be expected is working and that you don't miss any gaps. And more focus on the EDR side, this time uh, I have two tools here you can use, again, which are very focused on the EDR uh, solution. What can we say? So here I wanted to demonstrate that with um, an holistic and combined approach, using the CM and EDR, you can get full visibility on your system and with the limited resources, it is also possible. So, for example, with your CM agents, you can get visibility on the native log of the Windows operating system, or Linux system, if you want so. Also, to leverage all the logs from your other solutions, third-party so solutions, and uh, also detect audit tampering um, on your operating system from like malicious activity, and also detect EDR tampering. One thing we do need to forget is like your EDR uh, and the CM agents. Because here, the CM agents is, no one is taking care of it. So my suggestion here that is, uh, I found is you use your EDR to monitor your CM agent to be sure that it's running. And one important thing is to use it via the EDR alerts um, and to not get the alert via the CM because if an attacker Tamper, for example, your agent, Splunk agent or Sentinel agent on your host, you won't get the alert. You won't be aware that this um, SIM agent is deactivated. So that's why you need to reroute this alert via your EDR solution, via a customized rule in this case, for example. Um, one maybe interesting thing, just to uh, conclude here, uh, talking about polymorphic threats, uh, I found very interesting, this is about AI. Uh, we are now going the direction uh, with a new type of threats. That's we feel how we feel the landscape, and that's how this black mamba uh, malware was reported. And what is using is like some automation, some AI power to just design the payload and um, uh, get into the networks. And how this is done is like first 
This is removing the C2 command and control needed uh, by letting the threat automatically uh, adapting to the system and detection that are on the system. So when the threat detects like a, a defense, it will just try another thing automatically. And if it doesn't work, it will continue and it will leverage some AI, some chat GPT thingy to always find a solution uh, to adapt to the threat. In this case here, that's how it works on the concept that was done by the researchers. Uh, it will query, um, the, so the threat on the system will query some AI, how, how I can I bypass that? Uh, it will get some uh, snippet of code, retrieve it, um, execute it, and in this case it was with a keylogger which exfiltrate all the information via Teams channel, again to remain and have a good afternoon. Any question? Questions, please? Anyone? No? Uh, okay. Thank you. And we will just go.